afternoon, so for the agenda that we're starting at 9 in, so we're right on time. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, uh, here and out there. Uh, thanks for your patience. My name is Jack Glassman. I am chair of the Historic Resources Committee, and I'm also a historical architect with the National Park Service, the Northeast, the, the well, used to call it the Northeast Regional Office, uh, where I work with the Historical Architecture, Conservation, and Engineering Center. So, um, gosh, our first meeting since February 2020, I'm, I'm a little nervous about all that, so I don't know if you guys are, but if you're feeling uncomfortable, I did, I did bring some slippers. <laughs> like the old days, at least for me, working from home. Let's get started with some current events, as we do traditionally, just wanted to share. And see that that down arrow is not working on this. Let's see. Okay, we'll use the mouse. Um, well, first and foremost, just wanted we all, of course, seen the unspeakable crimes and the and the, what's going on in Ukraine. And uh, there, are, as we all know, many ways we can help in terms of the needs of medical and you know responders and. And, and aid, but also uh, in addition to that, within our kind of field, there are ways to uh, kind of support uh, conserving the threatened artifacts and cultural resources. So, um, Jack, if I may, please. how about a moment of silence to hope that the world is rescued from the tyrants that, are, in my opinion, the most awful people on earth. Yep. Here. Pray for change, things to get better. Peace. Um, yeah. Copy news. Uh, fun to our Zoom is covering some of that. Uh, but to, anyway. Happier news, congratulations to Allison Frazee, who's the new permanent new executive director of the Boston Preservation Alliance. Allison's been involved, many of uh, you have met her and worked with her on advocacy uh, and uh, other things in supporting the alliance and uh, uh, supporting Greg as executive director, and she's now uh, taking the helm. And so, uh, great news, and she will be continue to be as effective as ever. Jack, I'm wondering on the right where it has three dots if that will allow you to make that disappear. It should disappear on its own. Right? Oh. Hmm. You need to drag it to the bottom. Drag it to the bottom. Drag the mouse to the bottom. Oh, there you go. Take it off. Oh. All right. But it should actually go away. Um, yeah. Hmm. You maybe need to not mouse over it. Okay. Oh, hide video. Hide media. No, I don't know. The video panel. Wait, one more down. Yeah, down. Yeah, hide media control. Down. Okay. And escape will show it again. Good. All right. <laughs> Uh, more happy news uh, coming up this month, the 200th birthday of Frederick Law Olmsted. Uh, I think there are some initiatives uh, planned, and uh, so I didn't have those, typically don't have those listed, but uh, there will be some celebrations, and I know this was announced by the uh, BFLA, uh, and I'm sure there'll be other references throughout the month. So wishing that the keyboard page down would work. I don't know why. Okay, here we go. Current events. Oh, note. Um, lots of stuff going on. Uh, this, just trying to give sort of some of the bad news first, and then the, there's good news, and then there's sort of good, bad, and mixed. But uh, uh, sad news is that the Sharif Crump and Low Building uh, demolition has begun. This is a saga over many years. Uh, there was a lawsuit, residents group that had sued. Um, uh, they were unhappy with the Landmarks Commission's uh, determination that of just sort of local significance wasn't enough to really, uh, it just didn't have uh, enough significance to, to save. And so uh, 
what is proposed uh, from many from several years ago. I don't know if the current proposal looks a, a lot like this. This one um, from the Robert A. M. Stern's office. Uh, whether it'll be similar, but you can see that it's actually taking the several buildings on the block and replacing them. Um, ironically, this is not the first Shreve Crump and Low building uh, to be lost, uh, the, the Great Fire of 1872. Uh, the, uh, uh, they lost uh, their earlier building, and or one of their earlier buildings. The, um, in Charlestown Navy Yard, where I, I was involved in projects for many years, so I'm sad to see uh, the street wall, kind of the facades of Building 108, the, the historic power plant, the, the, the site itself was just a environmental mess, uh, and that's what stopped it all these decades, really, the, the work, because of so much of the, the cleanup. Uh, I don't know why you couldn't keep up the facades, but in any case, that's, that's the designation of a powerhouse of partners with, uh, to redevelop the building, uh, sort of mixed use. You see a schematic rendering uh, there, and they are planning to kind of reconstruct the kind of reconstruct the street walls with the the envelope. So uh, it's great that something is finally happening. I'll say, and it's all net next to the historic rope walk, and uh, uh, it's a site. It's really kind of the last, I think, major kind of site within the redeveloped Navy Yard, kind of waiting to happen. Uh, just next door, practically, is the Chain Forge. Um, the, uh, this was slated uh, to, again, after many years and back and forth and working with uh, how to preserve some of his, the equipment, the massive equipment inside. You can see a picture here of some of the, the forge, the hammers, um, to uh, how to balance that with some public access. And so there was a, a plan advanced and really just sort of waiting for them in the economy uh, and financing and COVID and everything. And it, then it just sort of stood still converted to, to convert it to a hotel. Uh, there was a rendering by actually my old office. I didn't work on this, but it's from my office at CH plus A uh, showing uh, Mostly just uh, preserving the facade, and lots of changes on the interior. So here, posed, existing. Um, but the um, change, uh, the recent change on that, I'm jumping ahead, was uh, to convert it to residential. So we'll, I, I'm interested to see how they'll, they'll still preserve, I hope, access to some of the, the, uh, the chain production equipment, but also is it going to be a glorified lobby for, for uh, residential. So uh, meanwhile, as Stephen Colbert would say, the Hurley building, it sounded like there was, uh, with their RFP, the, the state of, to redevelop the, uh, the site, that there was going to be some accommodation, uh, you know, including preservation in some, some form, uh, massing and building. Uh, but um, Chris Grimley had sent a letter to the editor. That's where I learned about it. It sounds like they're not being transparent at all about uh, the, the proposals received and which is preferred. So uh, it may be that uh, saving uh, at least some of the building uh, may be question, questionable again. We're not really sure. So um, uh, if anyone, by the way, if anyone knows uh, more, uh, feel free to uh, you know pipe up. So sometimes I, I find things from my sort of this virtual kind of clipping service that I'd like to like to do and it might be a, they're two, three weeks old and there may be sometimes certain developments. Um, we talked about Ukraine. I this, saw this story in the globe. Um, <clears throat> this is the uh, the cave, the Kivian, Kivian cave, cave monastery, uh, which dates back to like the eleventh century, right, in Kiev. And beneath all these onion, onion domes, that's this whole sort of network of, of caves where monks just it's operated by, you know, operated, the wrong word, but um, practiced uh, by candlelight um, for centuries. And so the Globe story was sort of entitled Putin's Desperate Quest to, to Claim This Ancient Underground Monastery. It's a UNESCO site. It's uh, really, con it's considered one of the 
the seven wonders of Ukraine, uh, and just seeing this makes me want to visit that sometime, this combination of above ground and, and below. So uh, no news, I guess. No news is good news so far as far as that. Uh, that uh, incredible complex. Um, but uh, other, we know other buildings, other areas are uh, have been already damaged or at risk. And meanwhile, the upper right picture is showing uh, some of the hustling that's been going on to kind of try to protect statues from from uh, bombing, uh, you know, explosion damage. Oh, well, back in the states here. Uh, saw that the uh, developer has proposed uh, lodging near just the sort of adjacent to the Mount Washington summit using uh, supercars, uh, using uh, like, I don't know, eight or something out of, uh, out of 16 or something of the cog railway cars. And so um, they have cast that as, an, an, among other things, kind of a way to help with the congestion uh, at the summit where this would be slightly down and they'd run a shuttle between, um, anyway, it sounds like it's kind of a, a fun idea, I think. Uh, over in the North End, a, a hotel proposed, uh, I was wondering, does oh, this qualify as one of our sort of historic resources, current events, but I thought since it's, it's, provide, it's kind of proposing what some might consider a kind of a wall, it's, it's definitely a gateway site, one of the gateway sites to the to the north end, where right now there's just a one-story building where people remember the old, like, Martinetti's liquor store and all uh, that whole area. And so now uh, something a little bit denser, and um, maybe it's, it doesn't look like whatever the north end looks like, and maybe that's okay. But uh, certainly attractive as a piece of, I think, as a piece of architecture, but uh, it'd be interesting to see it in a larger context there. The uh, Dorchester Heights Monument, uh, Boston National Park site. Uh, they are uh, it's overdue, really, for some uh, repairs to some of the structural landscape features, the stairs, and also they are uh, beginning work there. Just want to pass that along, making use of the Great American Outdoors Act go up funding. Uh, I thought this was a wonderful picture, but also just. <laughs> uh, as a as a photo, but also the dogs uh, are kind of relevant because I guess it's become one of those those dog park uh, you know those kind of uh, controversies that come up between the people that want that don't like the unleashed dogs running around and others who face you know, critical open space. But anyway, there's a picture of the stairs. What needs to be done there? The, the Mattapan trolley, the Mattapan Ashmont. Uh, more uh, good news is that finally the, the first of uh, eight, as the saying, for, of eight of the 1940s cars has been refurbished. Uh, the rest will come, and um, I think it's it's uh, just a whole cool uh, cool line to begin with. I think every every Boston resident should at least once travel that uh, travel that line from Ashmont through Milton to. Uh, to Mattapan, uh, it goes through along the uh, urban wilds, goes along, um, I guess, by Milton. You're looking at the sort of marshland. It's just, it's just really incredible. I guess uh, uh, New Orleans has this uh, St. Charles. There's a sort of trolley line. It'd be sort of like Commonwealth Avenue if it had this uh, little sort of trolley going down it, but uh, which is, I think, one of their treasures. This is different in that you're really just Sort of forget that you're in the in the city as you're making your way along in this uh, light, whatever they call it technically, sort of light rail uh, system. So so glad that it's being preserved. Gas light uh, conversion. Uh, so the first uh, in uh, so Bay Village, uh, they put a prototype a LED version of the gas lights, and so uh, part of the city's sustainability. Well, for many environmental reasons, <laughs> methane gas, uh, the leaks, the uh, uh, saving money, saving energy. So uh, there was the one light that was uh, installed, and then I guess they took lots of comments, and some people are are not perfectly happy with the color temperature and so on. But I think they'll I think they'll get that all that all worked out. Of course, the funny 
part about somewhat funny part about it is that the these lights, the, the historic lights, are really many of them uh, were installed in I guess the 1960s, and so they were they are not actually the kind of the original original gas lights that will be replaced, but they were replicas. MIT is launching a new Morningside Academy for Design. It's going to be led by John Oxendorf, the famous Guastavino scholar, among other uh, MacArthur Prize winner. Um, so, uh, and it's going to occupy the Metropolitan Warehouse, the, uh, which has been sort of a, a red white elephant for <laughs> for many years. Uh, what to do with it? Uh, with so few windows and uh, working with the Cambridge Historical Commission. So, anyway, uh, I don't know the details about the, uh, the academy, but uh, I'm sure they're going to be doing great things. Um, and so on the agenda, I just uh, I wanted to share uh, the other kind of good news is that they are going to the the great mosque of Al Nuri that was. Um, <clears throat> Just nearly destroyed by ISIS in like two different campaigns. I think it was 2017. It finally uh, was knocked down. The minarets and see the top of it, the lower left. They're sitting. Uh, it's going to be um, with, I think, again some UNESCO funding, and it's going to be uh, rebuilt. And uh, and I guess Mosul actually has this vibrant art scene so uh, that I was also reading about. It's kind of interesting thinking about it like maybe it's sort of like Seattle and it's, uh, and it's sort of hip uh, from a few years ago, that kind of scene there uh, for public, for art and public art. Uh, and what might, would be probably interesting to uh, teach uh, kids about uh, the, the approach for rebuilding the minaret, they are going to preserve the land. Uh, they're going to re rebuild it uh, with with the, the lean, which I guess had happened over centuries. So that is what I have, and we're thrilled. <laughs> oh, I, well, I also had a, a, yes, there was a clipping. I, I, if anyone's interested, by the way, uh, about uh, the Abigail Adams statue, about possibly uh, moving it to a different location in Quincy, and so there are some people are not happy that she's getting being moved from a, from a more prominent place to a less prominent place. So um, let me escape and stop my share. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Do you mind if I replace you? If, uh, I don't. Uh, okay. <coughs> like me to introduce myself? Oh, we, yeah, we have a slide. We can introduce okay. ourselves. That's okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Welcome. Thank you for your seat well, and everything. No, I, I just want to say this was a presentation that I, I, I saw and was happy to see as part of a, a uh, virtual conference for national preservation and education. And I was really taken by it and very excited to see that the, the leaders who are all Boston based. So I thought this would be great for you to, to, to share the important work that, that, that's going on and maybe get our, maybe there are ways we can support it. So yes. welcome. Thank Yay. you so much. Thank you for having us. Um, yep, so we're here to talk about sort of some some recent developments and initiatives in trying to teach heritage preservation in public schools. Um, there are some learning objectives. We're not going to go through all of them specifically, but we're hoping that after today's presentation, sort of everyone who's on the call and in the room will have some ideas about the challenges for teaching heritage preservation in public schools, some of the current and previous um, attempts to do that, and some really tangible ways about how we can move that movement forward um, and overcome some of those challenges. So, brief introduction. Oh. Hi, I this can is Adrian. someone on the call. Yeah, I, we can't see your screen. Oh, you can't see it. Hold on. Thank you for calling us. Hey, let me go. Not sharing. Oh, I see. So Zoom, here, share screen. I do that, I think it works. Yeah. My bad. Thank you. 
Thanks. All right. All right, thank you for telling us. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Is everyone good yes, now? Very good. Okay. Very good, thank you. Perfect. Thank so you. sorry, thank you so much. Yeah, so these are the learning objectives. Again, just hoping we can have some really tangible action items and thoughts and discussion um, throughout the process to move you know, teaching heritage preservation in public schools forward. Um, we three are Boston based, as Jack mentioned. I'm Helena Curry. I'm a building and closure uh, preservation engineer in Boston. I'm also the president and chair of the student outreach committee for the Association of Preservation Technologies Northeast chapter. And I'm also involved in the international chapter as a co-chair of the academics and research committee. So APTI and APTNE are really the, the first organizations that were involved in this initiative. And we've been gaining partners and building sort of a, a professional coalition along the way. So with that, Kate, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Um, so I'm Kate Carpenter Bernier, and I am a Boston educator at both public schools and, um, and charter schools. I was the principal of Matt's Community Day Charter School. And I also um, have a master's in urban planning and was mentored by um, a historic preservationist, Michael Tomlin, which is very wonderful. And so I was really delighted to be able to blend together my education and my preservation and planning background to work on the curriculum. And my name is Mika Hales. I'm a structural engineer, um, so a little bit different, though I do do a lot of you know, historic preservation projects. I'm working on how to structurally maintain uh, the integrity of existing buildings. Um, I'm really interested in a lot of outreach, so I've been involved with Boys and Girls Club, Girl Scouts of America, um, all different things. Um, you know, myself being a woman and being a minority, um, it was always important for me to see that kind of representation. Um, so that's kind of how Lena and I got involved together with her seeing my my efforts and my interests um, when we realized that a lot of what we wanted to do and accomplish was very aligned. So three different perspectives, but we think that that feeds in really well to sort of creating a, um, a diverse um, and unique pilot program for teaching preservation in middle school, public school settings. Um, so just an overview, um, you know, we want to talk about the motivation, and a lot of our motivation for doing this is nothing new. Um, but the way that we've sort of approached it and tried to learn from past attempts um, is something that we'd like to share. And then also, you can't see at the bottom, at least in this room, because we have to hide this. Hang on. Learn that. Um, sort of where we are in, the, in terms of implementing the pilot program and then having, hopefully, a really good open discussion. So the motivation for teaching uh, heritage preservation is, you know, many of us know that the preservation industry, whether it's architecture, conservation, construction, engineering, you name it, um, the workforce is not as diverse as, as the communities that we serve, right? So a lot of professional interventions are geared toward, you know, college age or high school age students and, you know, there's a lot of statistics and research out there showing that that's too late. A lot of students by that point in time have already been deterred from a career in science, engineering, um, math, science, you know, all of those things. So we really saw the need to focus at the middle school level um, and, and increase the diversity of the pipeline before the pipeline gets too narrow. Um, part of doing that and part of our goal in doing that is to approach these students with a broader definition of what it means to be in a STEM or a STEAM career. Um, by highlighting that there are opportunities beyond traditional engineering and architecture, and there's really community members, advocates, tradespeople, educators, you know, that list of people involved in this movement is so much broader um, than just mathematicians and scientists and architects. Um, it, we realize and acknowledge that in order to do this, we need to create a program or a framework that is aligned with academic standards, something that um, a lot of initiatives have run into before is that what they're trying to teach is not on the exam at the end of the year, and so it's deterring for teachers to take time out of their day to use an outside curriculum that's not getting them toward the end goal of having their students do well on standard examinations. We want to communicate the need to memorialize, celebrate, and protect all histories, which means developing a curriculum that doesn't just pull from the existing historic landmark stock, but pulls sort of creative, um, you know, new examples that aren't necessarily in the history books already um, and are part of current discussions to be landmarked and deemed historic. Um, again, as Mika said, they really get that representation out there. 
Um, and then to provide experiential, authentic learning experiences and have the students, help the students gain an appreciation for their own community. So not, again, not pulling from examples that are in New York City or Boston if that's not the neighborhood these students are in. We want the students to see building examples that they see on their walk home or on their way to the grocery store. All right, so in our approach, step one was really to identify target schools and grade levels. And these are some of the schools that we've been talking with and researching um, that do serve a diverse population of students in and around the Boston area. One of the things that really hit me in doing the research and, and, and why we're focusing this effort on the middle school level is if you look at some of the questions these students are asked, this, these are examples of grade five science questions that they get on their MCAS, their standardized testing at the end of the year. So you can see they're learning about renewable energy, they're learning about how light bounces off objects, you know, they're learning about, um, you know, all of these different things, flexibility a little bit on strength and hardness and light and perspective. And then what was really amazing to me, that was, that was not shocking, you know, fifth grade, great, we're sort of learning about nature and natural sciences. By eighth grade, they're starting to get questions on, you know, what is a structural system? What is in compression? What is in tension? How flexible? How rigid? So from fifth grade to eighth grade, just looking purely at the types of questions they get on a science exam at the end of the year, you can see that between fifth and eighth grade, there's a huge jump in what the students are expected to know. And this is just really a great gap um, in years um, and a great, you know, uh, topic base for us to intervene in and help support. So I wanted to pass off to Kate. Yeah. So what Lena, like what Lena said, high school and certainly college is too late. Like if you want to capture kids and give them the opportunity to um, enter into the fields of architecture, engineer, historic engineering, historic preservation, you have to get them in middle school. And um, I'm both a teacher and administrator and I'm also a parent of a sixth grader. And this, this curriculum was geared towards sixth graders. And that said, we're a little bit, um, we have content that's fifth grade content, we have content that's some seventh grade content because, well, <coughs> I would say two different reasons. One, definitely because of COVID, there's going to be significant learning gaps, and then some students might be accelerated, but very few. And then the second is, um, most of the time in urban education, there are significant learning gaps. So if you can go, go reach, be reaching back and grabbing fourth and fifth grade content, that is very useful um, to the teachers and to the students. Um, this is content around research on the middle school brain um, and how they learn. And so students at this age, they need their ideas grounded in active, engaging experience. You want them to give them the opportunity to actually generate their own content. So doing project-based learning is huge for them. They love to create. You want to challenge them. And then you also want to connect it to like a real life challenge. And you'll see at the end, like our, our, our master project at the end is a, is a real life challenge. Um, and then you want to give them the opportunity to explore different media. So they want to have um, the hands-on tools that architects and engineers use. They want to be able to use their computers. Um, and then they want to um, finally practice presentation skills. So I also work in Lawrence with a group of um, folks who are identifying the qualities that all Lawrence Public Schools students should have, and one across the board is public presentation. They need to be able to speak coherently and rationally about um, the topics that they're defending. So, and then from the brain standpoint, this is the time, and literally a 12-year-old, where their brains, um, their neurons are, are, are really kind of, the wiring is hard, hard mapping, it's hard wiring at this time. And then if they're just doing video games or watching TV, passive activities, that's what's getting hardwired, that it, or that, that kind of atrophy is getting hardwired. Certain things are not developing. If you're developing, um, conversely, these skills in addressing challenges and creating, that's where they are going and developing that. And then there's a big equity issue. Like, so in Boston, all of my kids usually were low-income, immigrant, kids of color, and they don't have all the opportunities the kids who live in the suburbs who are more affluent, on, you know, even locationally um, with fields and stuff. So the more we can bring project-based learning into their existing environments, after-school programs and school programs, the better off for the kids in promoting equity. Yeah, and to your point too, Kate, yeah. you know, one of the things we teach or we really try to reinforce throughout the curriculum is the, the 
ability to observe and notice, right? So we teach them how to observe and notice in the classroom and again hope that they're carrying that and starting to notice and observe, you know, throughout the rest of their day as well. So with that, we wanted to just quickly take a moment to share. We don't take a ton of time, but just curious going around the room if you if anyone's had a specific moment in their early childhood that sort of steered them into their current career. So for me, in sixth grade, um, all of my teachers band together for a couple of weeks and we did a dream home project. We were open-ended, no requirements, here's a bunch of building materials, what's your dream home, make a floor plan, and we spent you know, entire days, all of the teachers coming together just helping us build these little models, architectural models. And there was no no exam goal at the end of it, but it was a very, it was a huge turning point because I was able to see, wow, look how much time and effort I'm spending on this one thing. And in my life, to Kate's point, to that point, I hadn't identified one thing I could spend so much time and interest on. So for me, that was a turning point. I'm wondering if anyone else has a similar or different memory. And if you're on the, the call, you're welcome to type it into the chat or speak up. Um, when I hit escape, to bring yeah. control. Okay. Um, this is Drake Jacobs. I have one observation on this. Uh, when I was uh, in elementary school, the assignment we were given was to draw a map of our sidewalks from the face of one building across the street to the face of the other buildings and to show all of the um, artifacts that are in the sidewalk. So if it's a grating or it's a manhole cover, it's a light, uh, light pole location, uh, parking meter, whatever was there, we had to try to show it uh, on our drawing. And that made me much more observant of what's in my physical environment. Yeah, so mapping is huge, and it's something that we actually do in our community okay. unit. Um, we encourage the students to map out their neighborhood and the buildings that they go to, the grocery store, the school, and sort of start to understand where those are relative to each other so they can start physically seeing the communities that they're a part of. Um, but I agree. Or, did, or Susan? Oh, uh, I had one moment as a, in my childhood that I can... Uh, think started me on the path of becoming um, a preservation developer. My grandmother, who in another time and era would have certainly been an architect herself, um, would take me downtown every Saturday afternoon with her white gloves and green bags, which everyone had to carry things. And after we did our shopping, we would have um, a small preservation lecture, and one week it would be windows for using um, both downtown crossing buildings or walking over to Beacon Hill. But one Saturday, there was a manhole cover open and guys down there. And my grandmother took one look and announced to the guys I was coming down to look. <laughs> <laughs> and no one ever said no to my grandmother. <laughs> so down I went. Wow. <laughs> but I was thinking about feminist uh, issues That's and cool. uh, non-traditional things um, you know, that, that uh, really, I think, uh, what is the fact that really was a moment that changed my perspective on how you do view, um, as my grandmother said, cities are not all above ground. Yeah. Right. That's great. All right. Well, anything else, type it into the chat. I, I don't want to, you know, we could stay here forever, um, but that's, that's exactly what we want to, you know, bring to the students is that discussion and that interest in the community around them. Yeah, just observing and seeing. Exactly, observing and wondering. I can follow that, that story, but as a, as a youngster, just and eventually sketching, you know, carrying a sketchbook. For me, I was in high school for starting to do that. But just the idea of seeing uh, in an informed way yeah, and, and so observing what works and doesn't. Yeah, no, Jack, that reminds us, one of the things Mika and I always do whenever we go to any organization is we gift all of the students colored pencils and sketchbooks, and we just say, you know, this isn't part of what we're asking you to do. This is for you to take home and just draw what you see around you. Yes. Just a comment. Uh, I was in high school freshman year, and uh, our 200th anniversary as the oldest public high school in America is this year, uh, English High, Boston English High. And uh, I had a part-time job after school, and 
I would be. I was a messenger downtown, and uh, we worked out of uh, what was then Cumberland um, uh, uh, Square. That was before the demo. City Hall was going on, and then there were a number of other buildings that were, were intact. But what struck me uh, was that, and I, I think it, 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 it educated me as a Bostonian um, about the importance of our history for the United States of America uh, with the, um, the Freedom Trail mm -hmm. that was started by the uh, it wasn't the Bostonian Society at the time, but the first go around was around, I guess, about um, uh, late, uh, early 1900s when the first postings of, of significant events and um, structures were all over the city. And, um, and I, I, I used to see these every day to the point where um, I could use those as points of reference from where I was trying to get to, and uh, yeah. But I think, I think as as a, um, it's it, it's very valuable, you know, for a um, a young kid to become to be made aware of that things that exist in our in our landscape. Yeah, something I've heard too is they can do um, for younger kids like K through five. You can do scavenger hunts with historic buildings by identifying animals and carvings like gargoyles. Like, okay, we're gonna go find the the turtle carving now. You know, so yeah. there's different ways to point out exactly what you're seeing depending on the age level. Um, so I did want to move forward just to keep it going. Um, we mentioned this earlier, but one of the things that we felt was really important to do, because again, the motivation for all of this is nothing new. Others have tried to do this and to varying levels of success. Um, but we did, um, as part of APTI's Academic and Research Committee, really try to look into past initiatives specifically to teach heritage preservation in public schools, not necessarily after schools where the student group is somewhat self-selecting, you know, not every student has transportation or money to participate in after school programs. Um, but what have we as professionals tried to introduce to the public school setting in the Boston area um, as a starting point? So we looked in, these are some of the organizations and groups that we looked into in terms of past initiatives. This is a clip from a 1970s, 1980s um, initiative that the Park Service was involved in, in supporting. Um, and one of the things we're really trying to do and that we, we love is, is what we've been talking about, which is encouraging the students to be provoked and to speak openly and freely in a safe and inviting environment. And the one way to do that is through student-driven discussions, right? Not starting a discussion with a specific answer in mind, but starting with a prompt that's of uh, the right complexity, the right level of interest to really provoke the students to, to lead the conversation. So this is an example, um, you know, it's on MIT's campus. It's pretty well known in the Cambridge area. But it's a very controversial building, and I think one of the things hard to see here, because the bar is kind of blocking it, but one of the things we like to emphasize with all of these prompts is that there is no right and wrong. There are professional people who love this building, and there are professional people who hate this building. So here, students, what do you think? Because there is, there is the spectrum of right answers. Um, and then experiential learning, um, this is a commonality in a lot of successful programs, which is let the students get dirty, let them get their hands on things, let them have that, that tangential learning experience. Again, take the math and science out of it directly, but make it more of an intuitive learning experience um, where, hey, their wall keeps falling down, so they realize on their own they need to make it thicker or stronger in some way. Um, and then again, local le relevant examples, you know, um, I'm a huge uh, advocate for the heroic books that Jack showed earlier. I love brutalist architecture. Trish and I have worked on a building together. Um, and I think, it's a great, I think it's a great topic for middle school students because it's inherently controversial, but they might not all have seen all these buildings, but at one of the project sites, um, Boston Renaissance Charter School, right across the way is a concrete skate park which you know, has a lot of similar forms. You can talk about concrete weathering and you know, where, they, where they skate the, or grind the skateboard. You, know, you see more sand and aggregate exposed, kind of like on a building on a very um, exposed surface. You know? So you can make these correlations um, just by sort of looking at the building stock around uh, the school setting. 
This is another example is I think by broadening the definition of what preservation means, preservation at its best is giving buildings the best shot they have at a long life, right? And even if it's not landmarked or significant, these are examples of buildings around Boston Renaissance Public Charter School. They're not landmarked, they're not significant, but they can be used to teach the students about patterns and interruptions in patterns. And what does that mean about what's going on? Um, so these three buildings, you know, have some deterioration or have had some past interventions, and you can notice those things, and you can wonder, hey, why, why is the paint peeling around those air conditioning units, right? Oh, well, it exhausts hot, warm air. That makes sense. And these are the types of things we want to show them so that they can start seeing it on their way home and they can start noticing when windows have been bricked up. And how do you notice that? Because the interruption in the brick coursing or the difference in the color of the material. And with that, I'll hand it off to Mika to talk about step three. Yeah, so we have all these ideas that we need to figure out how we're going to apply them and what's important to us. And I, one of the things I remember you know, quite vividly, I think a lot of us do, is sitting in you know, a calculus class or a pure math class and going, why am I doing this? There's no possible way I could ever need that. And kind of one of the things I like about how we've gone about this is trying to flip that. Start introducing the idea of preservation, getting the students to buy in, feel that it's important to them, and then going, here's the math and the science and the sociology behind all of that, and introducing that material second, um, and leading with the why versus the what. Um, so, the way we've organized some of the curriculum we've put together really has that emphasis on getting the students buy-in up front. So there's a couple weeks spent having the students identify what is important and significant to them. Because what is important to one student might not be different to the other students, and that's okay, and having it be this wide open thing, but making sure that they see how this might be applicable to themselves and getting them to care about it before we teach them the, you know, the technical skills behind all of this. Um, we wanted it to be very inclusive, so it includes things like kind of open-ended deliverables. You can do a poster. The student who is terrified of speaking can write something. The student who has dyslexia can speak because that's more available and open to them, and making sure that it's giving the students the best chance to succeed in a way that is comfortable for them really sets it up and removes the barriers that these students might have from succeeding in a program like this, right? If everything's written, students who don't write well can't succeed, and everything's spoken, students who don't speak well can't succeed. And so we really want to make it a way that, you know, they feel like it's a, a venue for them to be them best selves, however that is approachable to them. And I think that speaks to the world of preservation, right? I'm an engineer. I'm really, really good at math and science. I am terrible at drawing and art and anything of that aspect. But an architect might say the opposite. They may say they're very creative and they love drawing. They're not great in math and science. But we still work in the same field. So there's a way for everyone to succeed here if they see themselves in that venue. Um, so as I said, we're trying to talk about significance um, and how it might be important to them in ways that you know is relatable. Um, so one of the examples Lena has brought up before um, is Converse shoes. Um, any pair of shoes in particular, not significant, but the shoes that Kamala Harris wears all the time, those are significant because you can tie them to a person, and that's the same with our buildings, right? Buildings can be important because the building themselves is important, or the building can be important because of people who use it and occupy it. And so a student's house or home might not be significant to the general public, but it's important to them. And, and kind of realizing that you know, we don't need to have these big overarching significant, but significant to one person is okay. Um, and making sure that the stories are reflected to the students. Um, you know, these students might not be going into Boston every day. They could be in a suburb and not have access to transportation. And so making sure that what's around them is significant and shown as significant, not just these big landmarks, you know, across the city or across the country that are very intangible to them. Yeah. I think too with the community slide that we had, uh, one of the analogies that we use is when you introduce being a doctor or you introduce Before. being something like that to a student at this age level, you're not talking about the scalpel and the triple bypass, you're talking about doctors help people. And so we're trying to make that analogy of preservationists help buildings and buildings help people. You know, we're trying to create that, like it's a community service, not a technical service necessarily. Um, so one of the things that we have kind of identified in this is making sure that 
we address the fact that as a society, we have not always been the best at preserving things that were not important to you know, the Caucasian majority, right? Historically, different minority groups may have not had the same level of attention and care paid to what was significant to them. Um, and many of these students that we're trying to target may come from those backgrounds. So one of the things that was introduced was the Taino people of the Caribbean, which is a, a Native American group. Um, their sites have been destroyed because they weren't considered important. They were just in generally more compostable, more sustainable materials that didn't stand the test of time, but that was never the goal. Um, and making sure that we can identify things like sites and monuments as an important part of heritage where the actual physical landmark no longer exists anymore. And, and something too that, you know, we have a whole sort of section on sort of what do we do as a preservation community to restore things that have been lost or, you know, aren't, aren't you know, haven't stood that test of time. You know, what's the reciprocity that we do as a group as well, which I think the students really buy into. Yeah. One thing I just want to add on uh, with, you know, kind of um, celebrating, say, Taino culture or Native American culture is um, Tainos are woven into Haitians, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, and so, um, which is like a large swath of our kids. And so when we, when we note that, you know, as the authorities, that just really bolsters them and their connection to their own history and heritage. And then trying to tie in kind of newer concepts, things like sustainable. You know, my generation was probably one of the last ones that was taught sustainability as a new thing. Students in schools now are, are taught sustainability as a, from you know, kindergarten. This is something that they need to care about from the get-go. It's not a future problem. It's not something they might have to deal with. They're having to deal with it now and they're having to learn about it. Well, the most sustainable building of all is the one that already exists. Right? And so we can tie in different aspects and things that students already naturally care about because it's been drilled into them from much younger age than some of the older generations and see how that ties in. So if you have a student who's passionate about the environment or you know, really likes you know, ecology, there's ways to tie that into this preservation as well based on things that they've already learned. Um, and thinking about the future and sustainability as a whole, I think is a really important part of preservation um, and ties into a lot of what they're already learning in school. Um, we'll probably skip this. Yeah. So, so we'll, we'll skip go. that was just an example of like a prompt that we would have for the students to identify something important to them and then to create a little, you know, a uh, checklist of if you had to have someone else take care of it, what would you tell them to do? And get them thinking about things that they protect in their life and expanding that to like, that's why we protect these things. Um, but I'll let, let yeah. Kate speak a little bit more about the, the approach in detail. About the, Thank you. It was standard. So everybody heard here of the Common Core. <laughs> um, so the Common Core is really important um, because it ensures that um, all students um, in the state and in the country are um, that their schools are held accountable to make sure that they learn a certain base of um, skills and knowledge in ELA and math, and starting in fifth grade in science. Um, and so. Um, it's really important for us to demonstrate to educators in schools and in districts that our curriculum is aligned with the standards. And so we did a lot to really understand um, the science, technology, and engineering standards, math standards, um, history and social studies standards for this age group, and then draw explicit connections um, in our curriculum to those standards. So we're not saying that we're going to be the one and only vehicle that's going to get your student to mastery um, in a particular standard. But what we will do is we will definitely be reinforcing um, that and giving you diverse ways um, to teach that to your students. And so, um, so STEAM is science, technology, engineering, and math. Well, that's STEM. And then art is in there because we have extension activities in art that are very enriching and wonderful for the students. And so, um, so sure, we keep going. And then, um, thank you. So claim evidence reasoning, um, you all might remember it as the scientific method. Um, but this is, claim evidence reasoning is the way that students are taught to organize their arguments. And so you assemble your evidence, you have a claim um, that, you know, say you think that this building should be preserved. Well, you're gonna assemble your evidence, all the facts 
um, relating to why it's significant to the community, its architectural features, um, et cetera. And then you're going um, to you're going to construct the argument. So that's going to be your reasoning. And so the kids are taught to do this in science class in middle school, in history class. I mean, my son's doing it all over the place. And so we have claim evidence reasoning woven in throughout our curriculum. Um, and then, um, again, making connections to other content that they are expected to be learning. So they're all about cells in sixth grade. They need to be learning about cells. Um, we like, we could talk to them about doing cross-sections of buildings and make the connection to a cell, to the earth, um, to the layers in an earth, um, and, and more. So, um, so we keep going. And these are examples of slides that are in the curriculum. So every teacher is given uh, a Word document with the whole lesson plan, the standards, everything that they could possibly need, associated printouts for the kids. And then they're also given a slide deck because that's how they teach, is you put up a slide and then you're using that to back up what you're saying. So, um, so, um, so as you can see, this is connecting to plate tectonics and rock formations, um, discussing, again, dur durability, so, um, and that connects to the, the, the strength of the products that they're going to be using, and then authentic resources. So, you know, they really, and then this, it's going to change the way they even just walk around their neighborhood. They see, you know, the, the pudding stone in Franklin Park, like it just changes the way you start to perceive. And then again, like I said before, public speaking is very important. And so teaching them to both tend to the technical aspects of their, um, their presentation and to the emotions, to the stories that go with it is important. And then Lena was kind of making the point that that's really important in her job, and I'm sure all of your jobs, that you, you have to balance those two. Right, before you even sort of intervene in a building that, you know, you know, serve the community, part of what, you know, we as preservationists do is we have to get the community's buy-in, and we have to understand everyone's personal story with the building and, and, and need um, for whatever the new, the new space would become. So I think it's really great to have them identify the different, a lot of students in middle school make arguments purely emotionally, right? But to, to validate that and say that has a purpose, but then to supplement it with some technical backing, um, I think is great. So this is in the, the third unit, which is the architecture unit. So the third unit is architecture, the fourth unit is engineering, um, and, um, and all the groundwork around community and equity and significance is laid prior to this. We are, um, they do a floor plan, and then they do a paper house, and um, they have to figure out the area using the net method um, to determine area. They're um, working with ratios um, and, um, and scale, and they're using tools that go with that. So, um, and, and like one of the exercises is like, how much paint would you need to paint this house? And you know, of course you want to take out the windows, you want to take out the roof. So they have to do all those calculations, which is also what they're having to do in math class. And so, yeah, and so uh, be just above and beyond, you know, what Katie just talked about is a little more math and science based. Um, we also have these extension activities that kind of relate to more architecture, so building and folding different pieces of paper to make small models. Um, isolations, trying to figure out the difference between area and perimeter and how we can be efficient with that, right? So kind of funny, unusual shapes might look very cool, but they might use more materials and having, having students tie those things together above and beyond just the lesson plans as, you know, I usually think Lena's organizing some activities now. We'll kind of <laughs> yeah. So anyone who's here gets to take one of these home, but it's a really cool paper folding activity um, shown on the right there. Um, um, but the idea here is that we get the students to sort of do this exercise with an art teacher or something, and then they can, you know, understanding sort of how it works, be free to create their own design, and you know, sort of in that thought of monuments and sculptures and things like that. So this is an activity I've I've done with a number of student groups. Um, <laughs> Everybody does it like, yep, we got the penny. We've done that before, right? <laughs> but the idea is, you know, you give students a couple parameters, build a bridge <coughs> with just a flat piece of paper, and then fold it in half. And all along the while, they're they're trying to achieve this certain weight, but they're observing what happens and what happens when you make a change. And then they're given an open-ended question of what's the strongest bridge you can build with just the paper, and if they've made the observations beforehand, well, you know, it was twice as strong when I folded it in half. If I fold it in half again, does that mean it four times as strong? Um, and having them use the observations to what they know to make predictions about the future and better their designs, which is what engineering is, right? We're, 
for using math and science to prove things that we know that we've observed before to design something that doesn't exist yet and seeing how that's going to perform. And then, um, as Kate talked about, um, the final community-based project, so after they've you know, bought into community, they've learned some architectural engineering skills, we ask them to propose a design modification to the building that they go to school in, whether that's a new building. It, it's a building they know well. It's a building they've probably been in for a while, um, especially in Boston. Some programs for sixth grade are K through six. Um, but it's also a community that they can identify with easily. So we walk them through sort of the activity of, you know, could your building be more sustainable? How is it already sustainable? How does it use outdoor space? Um, you know, is there a commonly disliked feature that could be improved? How does the community or the public interact? Do they ever come into the building? Is there a performance space that serves multiple purposes? Um, you know, the example here at the right is just, you know, turning the roof into a green roof. Um, but really, again, backing it up with both emotional and technical arguments and having a science fair presentation with, where you invite the community in, you really showcase the students' abilities and their investment in their own community. Because I think that's a big thing, that a big theme is that when we do get students interested in preservation, um, you know, we want to make sure, too, that they, they sort of give back and invest back into their own community. Um, so I think this is a great way to do that. It's a great way to get them talking with actual professionals in the air involved in decision making in the area um, and to just bring everybody together. Um, and then this is, Kate touched on this a bit and we'll just breeze through this, but one of the barriers um, that previous curriculums have faced is that, you know, you need teacher buy-in, you need to make it easy for the teachers, you need to make it valuable to them. And one of the things that we've done, um, you can go to the next slide, is we've created all of the materials, as Kate mentioned, lesson plans, you know, te uh, sample exams, art extension activities, slides, and they're all in Google Docs, so they are all easily editable. Um, there's no privileged software that you need to adjust them. And then, Kate, do you want to talk about assessments? Sure. So, um, so everybody's always, like, you, you want to know what the kids learned every lesson. And so um, there's something called exit tickets. They're very commonly used. They're just very short questions, maybe one or two questions at the end of each lesson that kids can answer really easily. You can flip through them quickly and see who's learned what, what needs to be retaught, what didn't land at all. And, um, and so we have the exit tickets um, in every lesson. And also a lot of lessons have um, on small projects and then every week you have um, a, a bigger project. So you have these, these performance-based, like, they're not performance, they're project-based um, assessments. And then we're going to be working on pre- and post-assessments for the whole curriculum um, to be able to, that are like sample MCAS questions eventually, to be able to see kind of exactly what translates to MCAS-style knowledge at that point. So that's coming. Yeah. So, and then the last sort of goal or step, and we're working on this iteratively, is to try to get the curriculum to be sustainable um, through identifying, you know, sort of sustainable funding sources, and also by creating that framework that we talked about. What we realized pretty early on is that if it's a static curriculum, you know, it's really only good for the one community and the one year that you have it. You know, information very quickly gets sort of outdated and no longer relevant to the students. But we want, you know, we're starting this in Boston, but we have plans to adapt it in other communities. So the adaptability and flexibility of having it in Google Docs, having it, you know, very, you know, free and available um, is one of the ways that we're trying to make it sustainable. And then identifying that coalition, which, you know, brings us to being at the BSA today, is we would love to have more organizations join us um, for supporting this as we move forward and try to get it into more schools. Um, and with that, you know, the timeline is, you know, clearly everything you've seen today is sort of the development of the curriculum. We are at a very critical point where we're trying to pilot the program in Boston public schools or with students that attend Boston public schools. Um, and we do plan to put out in the next month or two a call for teachers through APT, AIA, NICP, hopefully BSA, just if any of our members know teachers who have an interest potentially in preservation and in trying the program out, um, it would be fully supported and sponsored by us. Um, we are seeing that, you know, at least for the pilot, it does take sort of a perfect um, set of set of interests for the teacher. You know, potentially a history background or a, 
an architecture background um, just because it is such a multidisciplinary program, right? So I think that going out to the membership and seeing who we all know um, would be helpful in terms of identifying some key teachers to start giving us some good feedback. When you say supported by us, do you mean APT? Uh, yeah, I mean, as sort of the coalition. So right now, yeah. APT International. Yeah, International is how has all of the funding, but sort of the donations go through ABTI, and ABTI gives the support. So with that, we're open to discussion, or we, I don't know about time-wise if we need to move on, but thank you. Oh, thank you. I'll hand these out, too. Everybody gets one to take home. Oh, is it also the, um, the lessons? Um, Stop sharing. We can see some faces right. here. And if anyone has any comments or questions and ideas for expansion and support, ideas, feel free. Here. That was a great question. Oh, there you go. You need to kind of look and take whatever you want. These are just sample um, lessons and um, from the deck. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. One of the things they're all different. Oh, yeah, okay. this is kind of a mix and match. Yep. Yep. Yeah. One of the things I liked about this program, it moves the students from a passive learner pouring stuff into the students or being more active and manipulative. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just gonna take this hands on yeah. it. Yeah. I think that's good. And it's kind of empowering. Maybe Florida would be maybe I doubt it. Uh, Ooh, the art school, yeah, go ahead. Um I yes. So I'll just introduce myself. My name is Daniel. I'm an adjunct architecture professor in uh, New Jersey um, at a school in Newark. And uh, But I grew up in Boston, and I just wanted to say that uh, when I was younger, I had severe learning disabilities that really hindered my capacities for math and science, and I really grappled towards history and um, built environment, things that I could touch with my hands, yeah. and that's how I understood history. And so I really didn't excel in school until I entered architecture. But so for me, something, a program like this when I was younger would have been a life-changing life thing. So uh, I, I will I'll speak to a similar experience in that I, while I love math and science, my toughest classes were always pure math and science. Mm -hmm. Once I got to applied math and science, it was a breeze. There are just some people who need an application for skills in order for it to click. And you know, I cannot be the minority here in saying mm -hmm. that. Um, so again, that's part of the reason why you introduce the why and the, the what before you introduce all the technical content beyond it. And I think it, it really helps for a lot of students in the way they like to learn and take in information. Yeah. It's, um, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think uh, one of the challenges that I run into the most in Newark is so Newark, um, if anybody isn't familiar, is severely deprived city uh, that's been ransacked by federal government, horrible policies, and so it's, it's a city that um, is severely depressed, and a lot of my students come from Newark, and um, they grew up there, and they haven't really lived many other places, um, and so the hardest thing for me as an educator is, ha is getting students to think critically about a place that they know so intimately well, and so I think um, teaching skills at a much younger age about, you know, that building wasn't always there. Uh, why is that weather stain on that siding? I think um, how you teach that is so important uh, to develop. And, and yeah, I, uh, I think bringing that earlier on is just really, really exciting. Yeah, well, I recently did a presentation at uh, WPI with a group of students where we talked about sort of common masonry issues, and then we walked outside, and we, uh, you know, I put it on them. I said, now show me some of the stuff we just talked about, and it was amazing how quickly, it, you know, five, ten minutes quiet, but then it was like rapid fire. Um, but I agree with you, like, if you teach it younger and younger, um, maybe you could lead a project with your, your college age students to work with middle schoolers at a Boys and Girls Club or, you know what I mean, or after school program, and they're doing something along the lines of this skill. Yeah. I, and then I they'd really, be learning as they're teaching, you know? Totally. Um, yeah, the art school is very much about, because um, New Jersey, uh, the only architecture schools are right now are Princeton, super expensive and elitist. So we, we're trying to create a really kind of Newark-based school. So we're always trying to figure out how Kane can be 
integrated into local high school programs and that sort of thing. So I'd be really interested in. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was going to say we'll connect because so yeah. the the next states that we've identified just because we have points of contact and interest in those areas is Indiana and Texas. But um, as the Northeast chapter president, I'm you know very interested in you know New Jersey, even though only half of it falls in our district. It's okay. <laughs> um, and New York as well is going to be challenging because New York public schools have a lot um, of different rules. I used to work a lot in New Jersey, in Newark, and in New Brunswick when I was at Citizen School too. Okay. I'm actually from Texas. <laughs> and, oh, wonderful! Um, I grew up at a really low-income STEM high school, and um, I grew up in Manor, which is a really, really low-income minority group where. Um, I was the only person that was white and I'm half white. So, um, and I think one of the biggest things that was really that just like that made me hate math and all that stuff, engineering. Even though I went to a STEM-based school, is that once I gave up, there was nobody really there to really push me or like give me options. And I feel like what happens in those type of schools and those type of districts is the moment a kid gives up, there's no one that really there to mm -hmm. really. Um, you just kind of go in a different path and you end up, I mean, I had zeros in math and no one was really there to um, kind of redirect and find other options. So I yeah. think if you started a program in, in, in middle school, that's like where most kids either think that they're a screw up with math and science and stuff. And that's really where you... I think that's where, like, I've seen so many kids just give up with a lot of talent. Yeah. So. Yeah. I wanted to mention too what you said that made me think of is that I just wanted everyone to know that ABTI um, has multiple initiatives in place for multiple grade levels, and the goal would ultimately be a K through five middle school, so that there's sort of a rhythm and a heartbeat of intervention. Because to your point, great, we spark a lot of kids in middle school, and then who knows what happens outside those walls and after the curriculum's over. You know, there's so many barriers that remain for many students that. We do want to figure out a way to, like you're saying, for those students who don't get steered by this curriculum or don't get exposed to it, to catch them before it's too late. Um, so it's, it's amazing. And I would love to talk to you more about your experience in Texas. And I was just contacted two days ago from Tennessee for exactly this kind of program. So if you could put in the chat or someplace who I would contact so that I can connect you with the foundation and also the historic preservation um, people that contacted me, whether it would be through the chapter or APPI. I'd like to get them this presentation and maybe we can talk about getting you their funding and, um, and adapting this for East Tennessee. Love it. Thank yeah. you. All right. One of the things I always loved as a kid and still uh, aspect of the seal is the detective work. It's yes. really like discovering it's, you, and, and then in the process of doing the detective work, the behind the scenes kind of tours that one gets and sometimes even as a professional and you know, I could like, I got to go up into the Statue of Liberty and uh, or what have you, but uh, that uh, discovery of the type of problem yeah. solving, I guess is, uh, it certainly engaged me, it always has engaged me, I guess. And everyone loves, you know, even if you're going to Disney World or whatever, the behind the scenes tour is oh, yeah. special. So. Well, so Michael, who's the co-chair um, and that Kate mentioned she knows as well, is a professor at Cornell, and he said he's given presentations multiple times, but, and one of the questions he always asks My is My mentor who, as well. Yeah, is yeah. Who, who here likes mystery novels? And uh, in preservation groups, it's almost always over 50%, because to your point, it's uh, we want to understand what's going on. You know, we're not satisfied with just accepting, you know, interruptions and in patterns and details. We want to know what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and feeds into storytelling too. I was just going to say storytelling. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think uh, teaching students how to create a compelling narrative um, is so important. And yeah, there's that's a skill set in itself that it really needs cultivating. So actually, and I saw, I don't know if she's still on, but I saw Lude Miller was here for a little while. Um, she's uh, at UMass Amherst, and one of her associates. Um, taught a myth class, a, a class on giving the students a building prompt with no information and they had to create a myth around how the building was created and what the original, oh, you know, far that. back, yeah, exactly. 
there's, there's ways for students to engage in the built environment that don't have to be so highly technical, but it gets them interested, it gets the buy-in, and maybe pushes them past that point of feeling not capable. And my, my sense, um, I'm at the beginning of my next career, which is going to be retirement, but I've been teaching for 45 years um, at all different levels. But I think what, and just in, in retrospect of what I see in society that um, um, there needs to be more opportunities where, where, where uh, people are encouraged to be, to, to follow through on their dreams. Um, one of my uh, mantras as far as um, explaining architecture to people uh, is that design is the process of making dreams come through. So nothing, absolutely nothing, is impossible. And um, keep encouraging people to keep searching. Yeah, that's one of the things Mika put into the structural engineering unit is failure is part of design. Yeah. Like, you don't figure out the best solution until you've tried a few things that don't work. Like the WD-40 story. <laughs> 39 tries before we got to 40. <laughs> yes. Uh, I live in, I think, uh, Boston's uh, uh, integrated community. Pardon. Thank you. <laughs> um, but every race created color. So what I'm getting around to is any of this material currently available in anything but English. So that, so no, but this is a great point, and one of our, our next initiatives actually, so Mika happens to speak French. Um, Bonjour. <laughs> so uh, French and Spanish um, translations are forthcoming. Because it's a framework and it's meant to be manipulated, we did want to get one round of feedback first, but one of the schools, Chelsea schools that we've been yeah. talking to, yeah. one of the classes we're targeting is a bilingual class taught in English and Spanish. Yeah. Great point. We'll start out with this. I guess that opens up. So there are bilingual charter schools, I know, in like Lawrence or other places. Yeah. Also. Thank you for your work. Yes. Thank, thank, thank you, you for being here. Being here, yeah. If you know anyone, I mean, thank we'll connect you. afterwards. I feel like thank you right on the phone email. Yeah. for the other connection. We'll follow up. Yeah. Really wonderful. And did you end up? All the time and yes, <laughs> the precious you. time. Thank you. For coming. Thank you, Jack. He's on the brink. So, uh, in terms of uh, announcements, for those of you, if you uh, got the agenda, there are a number yeah. of announcements in the agenda. If you didn't, uh, email me and I can send it to you. Uh, one thing I just wanted to point out uh, Susan wanted to talk about an upcoming celebration. Yes. Um, Paul Rudolph. Have, uh, 50 plus year member of First Church Boston. And uh, I cannot believe that uh, this is a genuine item for the Historic Resources Committee because the current church sanctuary by Paul Rudolph is going to be 50 years old. Um, technically historical. <laughs> um, I also want to mention one other thing. Last month, um, I believe it was Jack, who did an homage to Susan Park, one of our community preservationists who now recently passed on. And I just wanted to uh, mention that Mr. Um, Park was a member of First Church and did serve on the selection committee for the architect, to which we were always very grateful. And the, uh, you know, it, the basic information is right down here for Sunday afternoon, the May 1st, and there will be tours as well as a panel. Um, discussing the sanctuary, et cetera. Okay. That will include uh, some architects and others? The panels will be uh, of architects. Mm -hmm. so. Great. Thank you for uh, thinking about attending right over in Back Bay. If you haven't seen it, easy to get to. So, um, please, by all means, come. I appreciate uh, Paul Rudolph's creation. Um, it's just by background, I should say that after the fire, some of which really were advocates. In fact, most of the community in the membership are advocates for saying they couldn't replicate the wonderful sanctuary that had been there before. 
um, after it was determined that not only hell, you know, not only no, but hell no, uh, to get well, then you get the best of the current modern architects. And then take this, um, yeah. Any other uh, announcements or anything? Shreve Pump and Roll, I think, is a disgrace that they're tearing it down. And it goes back, uh, Jack and I worked at the BRA together and uh, Stephen Coyle, who was the uh, best um, BRA planner director ever in Boston. And it comes to mind, if you're familiar with Atlantic Avenue, um, with the um, the corner of uh, facing Atlantic Ave, you have a uh, fire station and about a 40-story building, but the anchoring on the end of those buildings were, were historic buildings along that landscape of Atlantic Avenue. And Coyle, as the director of the BRA, insisted that those buildings be incorporated into whatever is coming after it, and I, I have to say it, it every time I go by it, I, I, I appreciate what, what his approach was. That uh, you know he was making the rules, and basically, don't even think about tearing down a building like Street Pump and Lola, but which you know is, a, is such a landmark in the Back Bay. And I looked at what they're proposing to do. Yeah, yeah, I'll certainly talk about location, location. <laughs> right there, it's a prominence. And, and it's about design, design, design. Yeah. It operate overlays of the old into the new. Overlays, too, and Art Deco and all. And, all right, thanks, everyone. Uh, next, next month, <laughs> meeting next month is uh, May, May 12th. Perfect. Thank you. I'm here. Sorry, I'm not covering you. Uh, I just got a bunch of stuff. Oh, yeah, it's uh, Maine. I love Maine, yeah. yeah. That was the same. Yep. And then Daniel's. Okay, awesome. Okay. Thank you. Oh, mechanical. Uh, yeah.